Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. In this lecture series, I'm going to teach all chapters of Fundamentals of Photonics, third edition by Saleh and Taik. I will try to keep videos short. Optics and photonics are both used in the literature, but here when I say optics, I mean studying light alone. But when I say photonics, I mean light interacts with the matter in some way. In the first half of the book, we mainly focus on optics, and in the second half, we study the light-matter interaction. In the first lecture, we learn the postulates of ray optics. Before that, let's quickly review the main theories of light. The most comprehensive theory of light is quantum optics. We will study that in chapters 12 to 13. In this theory, light is composed of particles that we call photons. The photons obey the rules of quantum mechanics. The next theory is electromagnetic optics that we study in chapters 5 to 11. That includes some topics like electromagnetic theory of light, polarization optics, photonic crystals, metal optics, waveguides, fibers, and resonators. In the electromagnetic theory of light, light is an electromagnetic wave. The electromagnetic wave obeys the Maxwell equations. The time-dependent electric and magnetic fields in an electromagnetic wave are mutually coupled vector waves. They are perpendicular to each other and to the direction of propagation. Here you see uh, the electric field is along, for example, x direction, the magnetic field is perpendicular to that along y direction, and the direction of propagation is along z. The next theory of light is a scalar wave theory, or simply wave optics. We will study that in chapters 2 to 5. In this theory, we consider the light as a single scalar wave function. And finally, we have the ray optics, which is valid only when the wavelength of uh, the light is much smaller than the size of the objects involved in the problem. In this theory, light rays obey a set of geometrical rules that, we, uh, that I will explain in the next slides. This figure symbolically shows which theory is more complete. As you see, quantum optics is the most comprehensive theory of light, and ray optics is the least complete one. Now the question is this. What is a ray? Ray is a straight line with an arrow which shows the direction of propagation. From introductory physics courses, we are familiar with plane waves and their wave fronts. The rays are straight lines perpendicular to these wave fronts, as you see in this figure. As I said earlier, the ray theory is valid only when the wavelength is much smaller than the size of the objects. Here, for example, you see that the whole size of the plane is much greater than lambda, which is the wavelength. So the light rays continue propagation without any deflection. If the size of the slit is much smaller than this, or even comparable to the wavelength, then we will have diffraction, which is the topic of next chapters. Now let's review the postulates of ray optics. The first one says, light travels in the form of rays. The second postulate is this. An ordinary medium is characterized by a quantity n, which is equal to 1 or greater than 1, and we call it the refractive index. I highlighted the word ordinary because today we have some unusual materials which have refractive indicted indices less than one, and in particular, negative refractive index. By definition, 
the refractive index is the ratio of C0 over C, which C0 is the speed of light in vacuum and C is the speed of light in the medium. Some textbooks use C and V instead of C0 and C, so that's a matter of notation. It is clear that C0 is greater than C, so that N is equal to 1 or greater than 1. The time taken by light to travel at distance d is the distance over the speed or d over c. Or if we use the previous relation, we can write it as nd over c0. We call the product nd as the optical path length. So it is not a distance alone. It is the product of distance and the refractive index. We have two kinds of media, homogeneous and inhomogeneous. For an inhomogeneous medium, the refractive index varies as we consider different points of the medium. So n is a function of r or a function of x, y, and z. It's not constant. Since n changes by the position, we should revise the definition of optical path lengths. Consider two arbitrary points A and B in the medium. Then the optical path length is integral from A to B, N as a function of R, dS. Here dS is the differential element of length along the path. You have probably have seen this kind of integration in calculus too. Again, the travel time from A to B is proportional to the optical path length. We can simply divide it by C0 to get the travel time. The last postulate of ray optics is Fermat's principle. It says that traveling between two points A and B follow a path such that the time of travel is an extremium relative to the neighboring path. The mathematical form of that is this integral, delta A from a to B, and R dS is zero. Here we call delta the variation of, and it says that the optical path length is either minimize or maximize or a point of inflection, but it is usually a minimum. From that we conclude that light rays travel along the path of least time. Is it possible to have more than one path between two points that minimizes the least time condition? The answer is yes. And we will see some examples in the next lectures. If the medium is homogeneous, then the refractive index is the same everywhere. And so it is the speed of light. The path of minimum time is required by Fermat's principle is also the path of minimum distance. This is called Hero's principle, and we know that the path of minimum distance is a straight line. Please be careful. I'm talking about one medium. We will study the light travel from one medium to another one in the next videos. So in a homogeneous medium, light rays must travel in straight lines to satisfy the hero's principle. We will see examples of inhomogeneous medium for which the light path is not a straight line. Finally, this figure shows how the light rays travel in straight lines. So for example, you can understand why the image of the last one is inverted. For example, if you consider the top point of letter P and follow a straight line, you see that the image is this point. And if you consider the bottom point, the image is here. And that shows why the image is inverted.